Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Mental Health Summit. We are just letting people in the room, so we're going to give that about a minute and then we'll get started. Good morning. We're just waiting people, letting people in from the waiting room, and then we'll get started. Okay, it looks like we're we've got everybody in, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Mental Health Summit. The summit is presented by the Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities National Training Center and the Association of University Centers on Disabilities and Mental Health Special Interest Group. I'm Kristen Dahl, Program Manager of MHDD. We are excited to have you join us for the opening session of the 2021 Mental Health Summit, Painting a Landscape, Mental Health Aspects of Individuals with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. We have two days of speakers and exciting topics. Throughout today, we will learn from multiple speakers how lived experience helps inform mental health work and how to elevate voices throughout mental health systems. Tomorrow, we will continue this trend of learning how lived experience can guide and shape movements while also informing evidence-informed practices. We will conclude with conversations around continued collaboration and ask for your input via the Mental Health Special Interest Group. Our presenter this morning is Johnny Collette. Johnny is Deputy Director at the University of Kentucky's Human Development Institute. Before joining HDI, he served as Assistant U.S. Education Secretary for the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services. Prior to that, he served as Program Director for Special Education Outcomes at the Council of Chief State School Offices, Officers. He has also served in senior leadership roles at the Kentucky Department of Education and as a high school special education teacher. From his role as a classroom teacher to state special education director to the United States highest ranking official for special education and rehabilitative services, Collette has demonstrated an unwavering commitment to raising expectations and improving outcomes for people with disabilities. His extensive portfolio of leadership experience including implementation of state and federal laws and policies and numerous systems change efforts provide him with a unique perspective on matters related to improving the educational and employment outcomes of people with disabilities. Let's talk about just a few housekeeping items for our session. Zoom controls are located on the bottom bar of your Zoom window. We will be using the chat box for comments or technical issues. A member of the AUCD SIG leadership Ty Aller will be helping make sure the Zoom room runs smoothly. If you have technical issues, please send them directly to Ty in the chat and he will do his best to help you. Please use the Q&A to submit questions for our presenter, which will be read at the end of the session as time allows. Other than those presenting the webinar, everyone is muted and camera access is turned off. This webinar is being live captioned. You can turn on captions in the Zoom window by clicking the CC button on the menu and selecting show subtitles. You can also change the size of the caption text by selecting subtitle setting. As mental health advocates, I think it is appropriate today to acknowledge that we are again and still in the midst of a shared collective trauma. The way we see ourselves, others, and the world has changed. For many of us and those we come in contact with, our reserves are depleted and it has become difficult to process the present without renewed anxiety. We continue to see isolation, illness, insecurities, and inequalities. There are disruptions to our mental health, physical health, and economic circumstances. But with those disruptions, there is also hope. We see shared resilience and strengthening community partnerships. We see increasing access to services through telehealth and online forums of support to share lived experiences. 
we see hope in a new generation that is destigmatizing conversations around mental health, around race, around disability. Let's continue to focus on the essential practices like following facts, taking news and social media breaks, and getting enough exercise, sleep, and social connections. And let's continue to grow and strengthen our communities by telling our stories, helping others and receiving help, sharing art, showing compassion, and making meaning. I'll turn it over to you now, Johnny. Thanks for being here, everyone. Thanks, Kristen, and good morning to everyone. Um, and hello, my name is Johnny Collette. I'm the Deputy Director at the University of Kentucky's Human Development Institute. We are Kentucky's University Center on Disability and are a proud member of the uh, University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, or USED, network. Um, HDI, the Human Development Institute, is a cross-disability organization. Our mission is informed by the lived experiences of people with disabilities. That's really important to us. And, and based on that, our mission is to advance efforts that build inclusive communities, that address inequities, and that improve the lives of people who experience disability across the lifespan. So here at the Human Development Institute at the University of Kentucky, our vision is the full participation and contribution of all people with disabilities in all aspects of society. So I'm very excited to uh, represent the Human Development Institute, the University of Kentucky, and our executive director, Dr. Kathy Shepard-Jones, uh, really to kind of kick off our time together in the summit and hopefully uh, set the stage well for uh, a, a wonderful couple of days. So let's talk a little bit about, and by the way, you'll notice uh, there is there is much information that I would like to share with you today, um, and you'll notice um, me perhaps looking back and forth uh, to notes um, on occasion because I want to make sure that I share uh, what we what we think would be helpful and, and important and relevant during this time together. So uh, I appreciate uh, appreciate your being here and for your engagement uh, with us today. So in terms of the object objectives, we will discuss current efforts across the USED network as it relates to mental health and uh, uh, development, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And again, you see there the acronym USED in case you're not sure what that means. It stands for the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, Education, Research and Service. But you'll hear me refer to that as USED uh, throughout our time together today. And also, uh, we want to share a bit about next steps to move forward collectively as a network and, and kind of how do we think about doing that, right? I mean, I get the privilege today to talk to, it looks like about 150 folks who are on here now and others will probably join. And when I think about the folks that I get the privilege to speak with this morning, which is you, uh, I'm thinking about those individuals who are the closest to um, the individuals with uh, developmental disabilities, mental health needs, uh, the, close, the closest to those individuals and perhaps are those individuals and those, I'm speaking to those who know the most about the needs uh, of these individuals. I'm speaking to those who work most closely with them. And because of that, I have a firm belief that you, are in, that, that you know best uh, about the needs of, of individuals with mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities. You are in a position to know best about what improvements and change needs to happen uh, to improve the outcomes uh, of, of the folks that you serve. So because of that, um, I wanna spend some time sharing a few principles that, that I think are important to help move our work forward collectively and individually. Um, one of the things I have found is that those who are closest to the work and know the most about it, sometimes um, uh, need uh, benefit from some conversation and thought partnership around how do we move work forward, especially if you know, we're in a position where it's difficult for us to make change happen. You know, how can we move work forward? So we want to spend some time uh, sharing a few principles around that that we hope we'll find, you will find helpful. Uh, so let's kind of jump right in and talk about uh, current efforts uh, in uh, mental health, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, there are currently 67 USEDs that exist around the country. Uh, you probably know, or most of you probably know, the Developmental uh, Disabilities 
Assistance and Bill of Rights Act or the DD Act uh, authorized the creation of the USEDs and USEDs are, uh, you know, exist at universities across the country. And all of those projects are unique and, and uh, particular to their context and needs, but all, at the same time, all USEDs do have uh, shared core functions. So core functions related to technical assistance and direct services, community education, research, information sharing, uh, so all of those are core functions that all USEDs do, uh, but all USEDs also are very unique and, and are committed to partnerships in their context, which are incredibly important in terms of uh, being really a bridge to the communities and individuals that we serve, higher education and other communities. Uh, so these effective partnerships are key to USEDs really uh, serving as uh, that critical role in some ways as a developer of partnerships that can promote change. One of the things that we have found in our USED here in Kentucky, and I know that this is true from other USEDs across the country, is we often find that we are uniquely positioned as a USED at a university. So uniquely positioned sort of between and among uh, other actors and agencies and organizations and groups and individuals. We are often uniquely positioned sort of, uh, again, between and among all of those that can really help to broker some relationships and partnerships that may be sometimes difficult for each of those actors to do on their own. So this is an incredibly important part of uh, what you said do are these effective partnerships with a diverse groups of people who, who bring particular expertise, but also who have a stake in the work. Uh, and so when we talk about partners at the center of that, uh, of course, are people with disabilities. And we also know the incredible importance of uh, family members of people with disabilities in terms of their support network. And also you see other uh, partners on this screen, DD authorities, state and local agencies that are incredibly important to the work that we do, as you said, in general, and of course, incredibly important to the particular conversation around mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Again, these are partners who bring expertise, they bring talents, they bring unique perspective and skills. And at the same time, they are also uh, individuals and groups who have a stake in the work that we're doing. Uh, and again, central to this are people with disabilities. One of the things I often say is that we all have a stake in uh, the life and success of people with disabilities. We all do. Uh, you have a stake in, their, in, in the success of individuals with disabilities. Um, states, um, uh, our country, uh, other organizations, communities, we all have a stake, but, but no one has more of a stake in their success than they do. And that's why people with disabilities are central um, to the work that we do, um, as you said. Uh, let's talk a bit. Uh, one of the things I was going to say, and I almost uh, forgot, is, is sometimes there are unlikely partnerships, right? So we've just been, we haven't been completely through. We're still in the middle, it seems, often uh, of this, uh, this challenging time due to COVID, but some unlikely partnerships have happened and some unlikely work or unexpected work, perhaps, uh, what would have been unexpected a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, one example would be how important USEDs have been in ensuring accessibility of vaccination sites throughout this pandemic. Uh, so again, three years ago, two, two years ago, we uh, probably could not have contemplated something like that. But that, that's another example of, of how you know, we get to partner and sometimes those partnerships are, are unexpected and you don't plan for those, but you seize those opportunities uh, to work collectively on behalf of the individuals that we serve. I want to talk a little bit about um, the MHIDD or mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities landscape, try to get, you know, sort of a picture of um, where we are in the world and in our country with this. And this will take us a bit of time. So I do, um, I do appreciate your engagement. I know how difficult it is to uh, just sort of passively um, engage through listening with someone who's speaking. So I really appreciate it, especially as uh, it gets lengthy. So um, I, I am grateful for your engagement and uh, at the same time recognize how difficult sometimes it is to continue to listen to the same person. Uh, but just a heads up, this is gonna take us a bit of time because we've got a lot going on 
uh, around this that I think is really important to, to highlight. So let's start with the Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities National Training Center that I know we're all very familiar with. Um, and this is an example of partnerships across USEDS at the University of Kentucky, the University of Alaska Anchorage, and Utah State University. And the center was established in 2018 and funded by the Administration for Community Living. Uh, and this center uh, seeks to improve mental health services and supports for people with uh, developmental disabilities and really uh, serves as a national clearinghouse and, and helps to provide access to you know, the most current evidence-based um, trauma-informed, culturally responsive practices that address the mental health needs of individuals with developmental disabilities. And I say, you know, we get to do this work because we here at HDI are proud to co-lead this effort. And from the very outset, the activities of this center uh, have been designed to be driven by the voices of people with lived experiences. So uh, if you haven't, I hope you will visit mhddcenter.org and you'll find there an accessible, usable online portal uh, that includes uh, digital storytelling, podcasts, webinars, fact sheets, blogs, and, and any number of other resources. And I think the mission and vision of the National Training Center are really at the heart of what this summit and these next two days are all about because at the center we promote quality mental health uh, care supports for people with developmental disabilities by providing access to information resources and training. So next I want to mention the uh, Center for Dignity and Health Care for People with Disabilities and again we're talking about the uh, mental health intellectual dis and developmental disabilities landscape right now and kind of what's out there and what's working well um, and certainly part of that is the Center for Dignity and Health Care for People with Disabilities, also funded by the Administration for Community Living. And this is another really great example of partnerships where USEDS have a meaningful role. Uh, so the Center for Dignity includes professionals, it includes advocates and family members at a number of great institutions and organizations. Uh, the University of Cincinnati Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, also the Maryland Center for Developmental Disabilities, the Boggs Center on Developmental Disabilities, the University of Kentucky Human Development Institute, Vanderbilt Kennedy Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, Family Voices, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, and the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. So the Center for Dignity has been uh, engaged in helping to lead conversation about inequities in healthcare experienced by people with intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, and to ultimately help end those poor health outcomes. And you can learn more about uh, the work of the center at the centerfordignity.com. I wanna also talk about Rush Universities partnering to transform health outcomes with persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities because that's another administration for community living grant and another partnership that includes USEDS. So we've heard about several of those already. And again, the critical role that USEDS can and do play. Um, and the work there at Rush focuses on uh, interprofessional education and training to improve knowledge, competencies, and skills of the workforce supporting and serving people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So moving on, I want to talk a little bit about the National Core Indicators because that's another great part of this national landscape that we currently see. And uh, it's been around since the late 1990s and represents a partnership between uh, the DD authorities and the Human Service Research Institute. And uh, this effort began, as many of you know, when state DD authorities agreed on a set of core indicators that could be used to assess state services for individuals with intellectual, I'm sorry, individuals with developmental disabilities and their families. So states are able to assess performance across life outcome areas that include rights, respect, choice, community, inclusion, relationships, health, safety, and other outcomes that go beyond simply measuring hours spent or funding levels, but actual impact on people's lives, right? So it's not just measuring time, it's measuring actual impact on people's lives. So an incredible part of the landscape that we have 
Uh, now, the Mental Health uh, Special Interest Group, or SIG, and you've heard reference to that already today, is a partnership around mental health, um, aspects of intellectual and developmental disabilities, and another strong partnership uh, uh, that is one of several SIGs that's hosted by the Association of University Centers on Disability, or AUCD, which is the umbrella organization uh, for the USEDs. And the Mental Health SIG is co-sponsoring this summit with the National Training Center. So we are grateful for that and thank you. Uh, the Mental Health Collaborative Group is led by the Nysonger Center at the Ohio State University and brings together grantees that have emphasis on mental health issues for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And then START Services uh, provides services to people with intellectual uh, disabilities and mental health needs using a comprehensive uh, model of services and supports, and it's led by the Institute on Disability USED at the University of New Hampshire, and includes uh, several USEDs. So uh, that's kind of a quick uh, landscape, and let's talk a little bit more about what we know in terms of um, mental health and individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So generally speaking, as I think we all probably know and talk about a lot in our own um, contexts and realms of influence, uh, there is a lack of understanding and a lack of culturally relevant person-centered services. And because of that, we what has resulted is very often negative experiences and life outcomes for persons with mental health concerns and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Now, of course, that's not to say that there are not good programs. We've just spent some time talking about uh, good programs and good efforts and good initiatives. Uh, so it's not to say there aren't good programs, pilots or communities doing great work because there are, but there are, as you know, uh, major needs. And we, um, I think, need to acknowledge that change is difficult. Uh, change takes time. Um, I often say that the right thing to do is almost always harder and it almost always takes longer. It's just the nature of change. It's just the nature of systems improvement. Um, but I think we have to acknowledge that, that change is slow. And, and we also need to acknowledge that we really can only measure the opportunities lost conservatively because there are people who are outside of the service system whose stories remain unwritten uh, for us. So uh, we know there have been devastating consequences as a result of the pandemic and the pandemic has further highlighted um, inequities and disparities uh, in healthcare. More of what we know, um, one in five adults experience mental health conditions. Of course, that's about 20% of the population. Um, Estimates of people with disabilities experiencing mental health conditions really uh, are much higher, though. The national prevalence rates for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and mental health diagnosis uh, vary ex extensively, really, between 30 and 50 percent, uh, according to a study in 2019. 40% uh, of adults with a disability experience depression at some point in their lives. Now, think about that 40% experience depression at some point in their lives compared to 10% of adults without disabilities. And uh, even more, 32% of people with a disability said they were mentally unhealthy for at least half of the last month compared to 7% of adults without a disability. And this was from a study in 2019 by the ARC. Uh, but despite the higher rates, people with disabilities are less likely to receive the mental health services they need. Now, again, I probably have not said <clears throat> one thing that you didn't already know, and that in many ways you know better than me. Uh, but it's important for us, I think, to continue to take a look at what's working well, uh, continue to take a look at what's not working well, uh, and then, then decide how do we work together collectively? How do we work together even more strategically? to address the things that are not working well on behalf of those we serve. So we'll come back to that again in just a minute. Uh, in our own state of Kentucky, uh, rates are even higher than those I suggested to you earlier or indicated earlier with 64% uh, of individuals in Kentucky with intellectual and developmental disabilities also experiencing a mental health condition. And that's according to the Kentucky National Core Indicators data in 2019. And given the fact that intellectual and developmental disabilities and mental health services often exist across 
different service delivery systems, uh, the process is even further uh, fraught with barriers and uh, barriers exist at all points in identification, assessment, referral, eligibility, service provision, collaboration, barriers exist across all points and at all points it can have a real impact on effective person-centered, culturally relevant and trauma-informed planning and services. A little more about what we know. Um, the 2000 needs assessment by the Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities National Training Center found that uh, mental health workforce is not prepared to serve people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and that there continue to be a false belief that therapy will not be of benefit to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So this same assessment uh, indicated financial barriers, a reliance on verbal communication, and a lack of training around other communication, including augmentative communication, uh, were also areas of concern that were found. Uh, barriers are, of course, more pronounced with more severe disability, and particularly noted were barriers for those whose primary language is not English and those who use uh, sign language. So this deficit of understanding of complex mental health and intellectual and developmental disability needs results in uh, populations that are often overlooked, over-medicated, under-diagnosed, and underserved. And this lack of education in mental health fields has led to students feeling ill-prepared Ill to diagnose or work with people with mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, direct service providers indicate a lack of training that contributes to service gaps. Uh, for people with MHIDD, uh, which are even more pronounced, of course, in rural areas. Um, individuals with mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families also report feeling uninformed and frustrated with service providers. And again, COVID-19 has increased these frustrations and further increased the need for mental health services and highlighted the gaps uh, and disparities in services in underserved populations. So in short, the outcomes are poor for people with mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, with the National Core Indicators Analysis finding respondents uh, feel felt more likely to feel lonely, uh, more likely to want additional support to maintain relationships, and less likely to be employed. Uh, mental health perceptions, misperceptions exist and service providers need training. Uh, many, many mental health providers report a lack of knowledge, training and uh, experience working with individuals with mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, one case manager, uh, anecdotally, uh, one case manager stated, many mental health therapists will not see my clients due to them having an intellectual and developmental disability diagnosis. They are often told that talk therapy is not a good match for them and behavioral therapy is better, even when they are already receiving behavioral therapy services. Many therapists say they are not qualified to work with a person with intellectual or developmental disabilities. Also, uh, we can't, I mean, as we think about that, as we think about these ongoing, right, these are not new issues either, right? So they are ongoing issues and concerns, ongoing and pervasive uh, issues and concerns. Uh, so we can't use the same ineffective approaches and practices and expect different results. So we're going to talk about that again uh, in just a minute. And, and as we've said throughout, you said play, uh, I believe, a critical role in, uh, in the improvements and innovations and partnerships that, that are necessary to, um, to improve the outcomes, again, that are ongoing and pervasive for people with mental health and intellectual developmental disabilities. <clears throat> So um, what we don't know, as we think about uh, extending that conversation, there are many things that we do know. There are some things that we don't know. I think, it's, uh, I think we probably would agree we don't know how state systems are working together or, uh, or not working together. Uh, we don't know how effectively they are or not working together. There's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we don't know uh, still about promising practices. And there's a lot we don't know about the longer term impacts of COVID um, 
And under the, you know, an understanding of systems, though, when we go back to that systems point, we're really we really don't know uh, across the board how how state systems are working together or not working together effectively. And and really, that's an important thing we need to know because an understanding of systems matters. Uh, an understanding of barriers that may be more pronounced in particular areas matters. Um, an understanding of you know, knowledge around strengths and areas of innovation and potential champions and, and, and even new partners in this work who can be engaged in positive change all matters. So um, I think we do think now is the time. Now is an incredibly a great time um, to really think about how we pilot some efforts that lead to innovation and transformation, uh, not only now, but into the future. So I want to talk, I know we're getting, um, uh, we got a few minutes. Um, but the second thing, as, as we kind of look past the current landscape of what we know and what we don't know, looking at a lot of the resources out there like we've done, the other thing we wanted to do is talk a little bit about how we move forward together as a network. And um, I hope this uh, sounds and seems to you as practical as we hoped it would. Um, again, again, thinking back to what I said at the outset that the individuals that I'm speaking with today, uh, you, you are closer to the work than anyone else. You're closer to the individuals. You know the needs best. You know, you have great ideas about uh, things that can be improved, innovations that can be engaged upon. And what we want to do is, is do our very best to help support you and to increase the capacity of those who are closest to the work to advance efforts um, that they know best to improve the outcomes of the individuals that we serve. So that's why we want to spend a few minutes on some, some principles here that, that we will share. But to introduce that, and I do hope this is a pretty provocative statement, right? I'm getting ready to make a statement, so heads up, that I hope is a provocative one. Provocative in a good way, right? Um, again, we've got these longstanding issues and problems and poor outcomes, uh, pervasive. So what we don't need to do is just continuing to continue to have, you know, grant cycle after grant cycle, you know, year after year, conference after conference to admire the problem, right? It's, it's not new. We know the issues. We know uh, what will work in many cases to change the trajectory to something more uh, positive in the lives of these individuals. So what we don't need to do is to continue admiring the problem. Now, I want to suggest, here's the provocative statement, the first step toward improvement, uh, the improvement that we envision, the first step toward that in this space, or I would argue in any space, is acknowledging the fundamental reality that we are getting the results we are getting because our systems are designed to get exactly those results. I would argue that it doesn't make any difference what system you're talking about. We are getting the results we're getting because our system is designed to get those results. So if we're not getting the results we want, then we have to do something else, right? We have to do something different. If we want different outcomes, we need to do something different to get there. So um, I, I do think that is a fundamental reality of systems change that is often difficult to hear on the front end. But as we live with it, we're like, yeah, that's, I can see that. We're getting the results we're getting because our system's designed to get those results. And if I want different results, I'm gonna have to do something different, right? Uh, it, can, it, can, it can sting a little bit the first time you hear that, but then live with it a bit. I commend it for your consideration. Uh, reflect on that a bit. Uh, but I think that's where we are. If we can start there, uh, then I think that's a, that's a great starting point to charting uh, a course toward improvement. So let me share some things. Here's the, here's my basic premise, and I think that you know I've I've kind of leaned into this throughout the morning. My basic premise is this: that advancing ideas for improvement or innovation within a system is just hard. It's hard no matter who you are. Uh, in case you don't know this, and I may never get to talk to you again, let me give you a, a tip. Not that you need it, but just in case. If anyone ever comes to you, uh, especially if they're pitching a product, if anyone ever comes to you and says, I've got what you need to 
to quickly improve your system, to engage in systems change that won't be difficult and won't take long. What you have is a great example of somebody who clearly doesn't know what they're talking about as it relates to systems change. There's nothing easy about systems change. There's nothing easy about it. There's no shortcut to it. And it's hard, no matter who you are. Uh, and, and that's something that, that we all know if we've been engaged in the work longer than a few minutes, right? Uh, but I think that can be even more challenging if you find yourself in a position where you can't compel the kind of change you know needs to happen. So again, here you are closest to the individuals. You know their needs best. You know what would improve uh, their outcomes, but maybe you're not in a position to compel the sort of changes that need to happen to make that improvement occur or to make that innovation occur. So the problem is not that you, that I, that teams don't have good ideas. The problem, if there is one, is that we may not be well equipped to advance those ideas. So it really doesn't matter how good my idea is if I can't move it forward, right? So and we know that one of the pervasive, or what I, what I argue is that one of the pervasive barriers in our ability to successfully move work forward is effectively approaching, engaging, and communicating with system leaders. Now, when I say system leaders there, I'm referring to you know, that whoever is the decision maker in that system, whatever system, department, agency, state government, federal government, whoever, this, whoever the system leader is you're engaging and talking to and whoever's making decisions within that system. But that's a, that's a pervasive barrier uh, for moving work forward is how we are approaching, engaging, and communicating with those individuals. So I want to share some principles in, in the last few minutes we have together. And again, I commend them for your consideration. If they're helpful, uh, use them as much as you like. If they're not, forget them as fast as you can, okay? So here are some uh, principles that I think you can use uh, no matter where you are and where you're situated. And I think will increase your ability to lead from where you are, uh, wherever that is. And the first thing is to focus on advancing the work. Now, as you heard from my experience and, and along with many of you, uh, we've been engaged in different ways um, to improve the lives of individuals with disabilities, uh, really from, from birth through adulthood and really before birth through death, right? I mean, we've been engaged in all of this work and we know this work and sometimes uh, as advocates and uh, champions for individuals with disabilities, if something we propose doesn't achieve our desired outcome, sometimes it can just feel like it all is lost, but that's not true. So the very first principle that I share with folks is focus on advancing the work. Uh, I would argue that the goal is to create and cultivate an environment where the potential to advance the work is increased. So in this way, advancement is the goal. And attainment is a bonus. Yeah, we want to attain that. We want whatever we're asking for because we believe that'll be best for people with disabilities. Uh, but attainment's a bonus. We should be seeking uh, to advance this work. Let's do what my dad used to tell me, right? We're, let's leave it better than we found it. So sometimes um, just a little tweak in, in how we're thinking about it can be helpful uh, in us continuing to persist and persevere on behalf of people with disabilities. If it doesn't happen the way we think it ought to happen, all is not lost. If we have advanced the work, if we have increased the potential within that system for this conversation to occur, then that's a successful thing uh, to have had happen. That's principle one. Principle two is understand the uh, system leaders' priorities. System leaders often have a particular set of priorities on which to deliver, and they often have a specified period of time in which to show results. Now, I think that's true for any system leader, but especially in some of the work that we do uh, that involves uh, uh, laws and regulations, this is particularly true for elected officials and appointed officials and the opportunities we have to speak to them to advocate on behalf of people with disabilities. It's very important as we seek to move our ideas for improvement or innovation forward that we understand that individual we're speaking to has a particular set of priorities that somebody is holding them accountable to deliver on. And they have a specified period of time in which to show results, especially again, if that's an elected or an appointed official. So because of that, understanding the priorities that they've got to deliver on and that they've got to spend the majority of their time delivering on is critically important to advancing work within a system. The third is, you know, I've got to manage my assumptions. So going back to what we just said, because the system leader 
has a particular set of priorities on which to deliver and may only have a specific a certain period of time to show results. Most things, even good things, necessarily fall outside of those parameters. You and I just have to understand that going in. We, we must understand that going in. If they've got to deliver on this and they've got this amount of time to deliver on that, that means almost everything, even good things, is going to fall outside of those parameters. So that increases the importance of engaging that individual effectively. Now, what I've done in the past, and I've learned from this, I hope, and many of us have done in the past, perhaps, is we expect um, system leaders to do what we're asking them to do because it's the right thing to do. Well, do you know how many other right things to do they've heard today, this month, this year, right? Um, I would argue that, that the expectation, the assumption that a system leader do something because it's the right thing to do is presumptuous. It's unrealistic and it, it will likely be unproductive. So what we've got to do is we've got to have a more sensitive and realistic and strategic approach uh, if we're going to successfully advance work within the system. I'm moving quickly, I know. Principle four, uh, then plan your approach, right? Uh, your perception of the proposal, my perception of the proposal, the perception of those that I serve, my membership, my focus group, my constituency, all of that's important, but they can't be the only factors guiding how you approach the system leader, how you approach, engage, and communicate with them. Your proposal must be perceived by the leader as something that does at least the following two things. One, it's got a, the, the, the system leader has to believe that what you're asking them to do moves their priorities forward or solves a pervasive problem. So if I'm pitching a proposal for improvement or innovation, I've got to be prepared to clearly show how implementing this could move the system leaders work forward, not just tell them how it moves my work forward, right? Really important. And I should be prepared. We've got to be prepared to answer the question, what problem are you trying to solve? And I would argue this uh, to, to all of you and, and, all, and, and that all of us could help, help hold each other accountable, including me. It is not the system leader's job to intuitively understand or frame the relevance of what you're proposing and how it aligns to what they do. That's your job. That's my job. It's not their job to just intuitively know how this all works together. And that's incumbent on us. And that's why we've got to do our homework on the front end, uh, not just saying you ought to do this because it's the right thing to do. No, here's how it moves your priorities forward. Here's how it helps solve a problem you've been trying to solve for a long time. Here's what we're asking really aligns to what you're doing and how you're leading in this system. It also has to be doable within uh, the time they have to lead, lead and worth the capital they have to spend. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, system leaders are, are constantly choosing among competing priorities and uh, the likelihood that, that whatever we propose is going to move forward is going to depend on whether the leader thinks it's relevant, timely, and worth it. And uh, that's not a commentary on, it's not personal to me, it's not a commentary on on the proposal uh, or the potential efficacy of my proposal, it's just the reality because systems leaders, that's the, that's the calculus of a system leader. We're always having to choose among competing priorities. So we've gotta be prepared to clearly and concisely answer the following things. What are you asking the leader to do? Why is it important? Why does it have to be done now? What are the pros and cons and who will support it and who will oppose it? Uh, I'm almost finished, I promise. But this last two, the, 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 how we respond to those last two questions, what are the pros and the cons, who will support it, who will oppose it? That's critically important to a system leader because a system leader will know uh, how you respond to those. The system leader will know whether or not you have a clear understanding of the broader universe of the implication of implementing what you're asking them to do. So again, that that is so important that we do our homework, uh, as we as we do, but uh, that we uh, that we do our homework and and are ready to respond and frame these things. Um, and the last thing is principle five: leave leave them with something they can use. The question is usually not whether the leader will meet and discuss your proposal with you. The question is really whether they'll think about it after you meet. Right. So let's leave them with something they can use something they can easily understand, immediately use, and that provides a reference point for us to follow up with them. And the bottom line, this is a, you know, anytime we have an opportunity to uh, raise the awareness and form the system, uh, the, the thinking of a system leader, it's an incredible opportunity. So if we can increase, all of us, me too, every day, if we can continue to increase our capacity to be better equipped 
to effectively approach, engage, and communicate with a system leader, we're going to increase our potential to move important work forward, including important work uh, related to mental health and intellectual dis uh, developmental disabilities. So, uh, Chris and Ty, I know I've consumed all of the time. Um, I hope that's okay. <laughs> Not much I can do about it now, but. Uh, you are exactly on time. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. Um, I have put a email address in here, info at mhdbcenter.org. Um, and you can email your questions and I will get them to Johnny and we'll take care of your questions. I will also get a copy of the slides. I know there's been a few requests for slides, so we can take care of that. And uh, thank you, Johnny, very much for being here with us today. And thank you to all of our participants for your time and attention during this session. Um, please visit us at mhddcenter.org for other webinars. We uh, always post those. And then session two, building community partnerships for meaning, co meaningful collaborations will be led by Dr. Verdi Rodriguez and Lauren Weaver. And it starts at 11 o'clock. So 15 minutes from now, 11 o'clock Eastern time. So thank you everyone for being here. And thank you so much, Johnny. Have a great day.